Hello friends, I am Dr. Kavita Arora. I am teaching geography at Shahid Bhagat Singh College, Department of Geography, Delhi University. Uh, as we know land is a very important issue, in this module we will study the urban land policy. This module will help you to learn about the urban land, the concept of urban land and the policy which considered an important area of study in the urban geography too. At the end of this module, you will be able to understand the concept of urban land, urban land policy and its economic, social and administrative legal aspects, urban land policy in India that includes pre-British, British and post-independence land policy. There are few more important aspect of the life of any society than land and the relations between land and humankind. Economists recognize land as being one of the three economic fundamentals of society along with labor and capital. It is no accident that anthropologists have and investigating traditional societies spent a great deal of energy in probing those societies rules and practices about land since they know that that will tell them much about those societies in the colonial era. The ownership of land has throughout the ages and in all societies been a major factor in determining classes, class structure and relations and in the allocation and exercise of political power. Equally the many and often conflicting uses to which land sometimes the same plot of land can be put have given rise both to complex laws and serious disputes in many societies. What is clear however is that land tenure is concerned with the complicated collection of rights to own and use space and it is therefore instrumental in shaping the spatial development as well as the broad social relationships within a community. In Redcliffe's view. 1976 he said, system of land tenure embody those legal, contractual or customary arrangements whereby individuals or communities through land, land without the dimension of tenure is a meaningless concept. The principal forms of land holding have been listed by Bracewell Millins as private property with single ownership, private property with commercial ownership, state property and joint ventures including the lease of land by the state to a private person or vice versa. Harland Bartholomew states that the land we are concerned with can be described as land now used for purpose that are characteristically urban. In view of this statement, the land devoted to urban uses and water bodies associated with this land considered urban land. Traditionally urban space above the surface has not been included in the study of urban land. Most of the land of the city is devoted to fulfilling one or more functions or types of utilization. Sometimes the use made of the land is intensive and other times the use made of urban land might be extensive. But in any case, the land is satisfying some need of the urban residents to manage the different use of urban land requires urban land policy. Now let us discuss about urban land policy and its economic, social and administrative and legal dimensions or aspects. Requirement of urban land policy situate between two extremes, the process of spontaneous urbanization and the process of deliberate urban intervention. This part provides you descriptive account of contemporary urban land problems and policies and this will also analyze the theoretical basis of these policies. The problem with urban land is that the problem of urban expansion 
especially in agrarian developing countries confront society with grave difficulties concerning the utilization of urban land in these newly urbanized countries the economic system is changing so the already existed urban problems have taken new forms the old methods of treating these problems are hence became inoperative and the new methods to deal with them not yet been developed in general urban government in any country intervene in urban affairs in three different but interrelated ways one by using the different fiscal devices second by legal restrictions of private right to use urban land in certain ways and third by direct physical undertaking of urban development projects the first type of urban intervention the application of various types of fiscal devices includes policy instruments such as the property tax controls on the pricing of urban goods and services and direct governmental subsidies and grants almost all the countries have the provision of property taxes and in recent years various versions of the simple property taxes have appeared these includes a different types of development levies speculation taxes and site value taxes but since they all have tendency to get affected by socio economic forces which determine the structure of the land market as a whole they remain ineffective in solving the urban land problems controls on the pricing of urban good and services include matters such as rent control road pricing legislated limit on mortgages rates and so on they definitely affect urban land prices and land uses but they tend to overlook the fundamental cause of the problem and they only treat the superficial symptoms therefore relying on them often in the end can complicate the problem further direct government subsidies and grants involve a whole range of policy instrument such as the subsidization of mass transit the allocation of funds to low income housing program the provisions of grants to community services and so on though these are very important interventions but they are largely depends on the public revenues the continued feasibility of these measures require that in a long period aggregate expenditure keep pace with aggregate public revenues this in turn requires that the demand of revenue absorbing sector keep pace with revenue producing sector another drawback of these measures is that they are tended to deal with the symptoms rather than with the fundamental causes the second type of urban interventions are legal restrictions on land uses these includes planning devices such as official plan provisions zoning ordinances subdivision controls building codes etc legal restrictions are technically potential for significantly modifying the operation of the urban land market however in practice because of political reasons they are formulated in the way that their impacts on the land market can be restrained the third type of public urban intervention is direct physical land development or redevelopment it includes activities such as the provision of various types of urban infrastructure and social overhead facilities public housing construction urban renewal the laying out of industrial estates land banking and so on these activities can play a crucial role in shaping the special configuration of urban land prices and uses yet ironically this type of intervention remains virtually incapable of dealing with real urban land problems because in most of the countries publicly serviced land is left to be exchanged and utilized by various private owners and users all of them have private interest and therefore their action lead to the uncontrolled 
unexpected and unintended spatial configurations, unexpected urban land prices and numerous other problems. Land is multidimensional in nature, too often policy has focused on one aspect of land to the exclusion of other aspects and not surprisingly such a policy has failed to achieve its goals because it failed to take account of the multidimensional nature of land. Land is the foundation of shelter, food, work and a sense of nationhood. Land is therefore inseparable from the concept of a civil society and it is inseparable from social and economic relationships within that society. Policies about land are policies about society, how it shall be organized and governed and what relationships there shall be between the different groups and people in society. Land policies then must be all embarrassing and cannot be based on any assumption that some land relations are of little or no account and other are the correct ones because this is a tenta amount to saying that some groups or people are of little or no account and other are the preferred ones. Such policies tended to be formulated during the colonial period, particularly in respect of customary and statutory land relations. But countries would be well advised to be extremely cautious before either continuing or adopting under, under international aid pressure. Similar policies now, equally it must be said land policy cannot be allowed to go by default. A national land policy is at least as important as a national foreign or defense policy. Now we will discuss urban land policy in India. Here we divided this part into the three parts before British rule, British time and post independence. Before British rule there was no formal individual ownership of land in India. Urban and rural both land belong to the ruler. A historical analysis of ancient Indian land policy suggests that tax on land played a pivotal part in the evolution and maintenance of the system of governance. The history of land administration date back to the olden days of kings and kingdoms. From time immemorial, land administration is considered as prime domain of the state. According to classical doctrine, all lands both urban and rural belongs to the king, a state which can alienate some of it for cultivation and other purposes to individuals. Right from the time of Manu, the land revenue has been a major source of income of the sovereign. During the Mauryan and Gupta periods, the revenue was collected by the paid officials which resembles the present day revenue administration system. During the post Mauryan and Gupta periods, the state revenue was collected, but donies of Brahmadeya, Devadana and Agrahara lands. The donies were feudal intermediaries who passed on a part of the revenue they collected to the king. Later in place of the above revenue collectors, the Jagirdar, Subedars and Imandars, Inamdars who were intermediaries passed on the revenues to the king during the rules of Sultanate which extended for more than 300 years. During their rule, the sources of revenue was twofold, religious and secular. The former called Jakar was due from the Muslims and Jigya was, which was the non-Muslim, had to pay. The process of revenue administration was started by Sher Shah Suri in 1540-45 period. It was continued and improved upon under the reign of the Mughal Emperor Akbar. Todarmal, greatest revenue expert who started his career under Sher Shah Suri, joined in the service of Akbar, is remembered even to this day for evolving a system of revenue assessment and survey. A system which drew a balance between the demands of the state and needs of the subjects. The revenue administration during the regime of Mughals consisted 
of a heterogeneous classes of persons which includes direct officials of the imperial administration like the provincial governors amils or the jagirdars and their officials and agents and representative of the peasants like the village headmen muqaddimas and the chaudhrys with the advent of the british in india the political and economic scenario underwent for reaching changes the revenue administration was systematized scientifically during british rule by introducing permanent settlement by cornwallis in 1793 and royetwari system by sir thomas munro 1802 the british colonial administrator also introduced a system of registration of all land transactions relating to transfer of rights and title by private individuals since 1908 the registration department came to be added to the land administration into three basic units one service settlement department dealing with demarcation of boundaries of individual holdings measurements of lands classifications of lands and determination of land revenue the second one was the revenue department dealing with demarcation of boundaries of individuals holdings and to decide disputes relating to transferring of land rights among the individuals or organizations and the government apart from collection of land revenue from the land holders the third was the registration department dealing with registration of all land transactions relating to immovable property land sites or building these three departments invariably exist in every state of india their commission composition powers functions administrative control largely vary among the states in this way during the two centuries of british rule 1757 to 1947 india's traditional land ownership and land use pattern were changed with the introduction of the concept of private property various land ownership and transfer system were introduced by the british like the zamindari system prevailed in most of northern india the raitwari system was followed in south and west part of india the mahalwari system was a third system whereby entire villages had to pay revenue with farmers contributing their shares in proportion to their holdings the indian forest act was passed in 1920 by for making all forest land government owned this delegitimized the traditional community ownership system in adivasi societies land distribution under this system became extremely unequal rural society was polarized landlords and rich peasants versus tenants and agriculture laborers by the time of independence in 1947 about 40% of india's rural population was working as landless agricultural laborer with the concept of private property british government also introduced the doctrine of eminent domain and passed the land acquisition act 1894 this act was later amended by act 4 and and 10th of 1914 and 12th of 1919 and 13th of 1920 and 16th of 1921 and 18th of 1923 and 19th of 1933 eminent domain is the power to take private property for public use by state or national government this law suggested that a person has a right not to be deprived of his private property except though due process of law which is conflict with the right of a state to acquire property under the doctrine of eminent domain the sect during the british period and after independence also for a long time remains the base for deciding the urban land rights if you look at the post independence urban land policy scenario we can see that level of urbanization in india is increasing in 1951 it was 17% 
which has increased to 31 percent in 2011. According to the world population prospects by the United Nations, 55 percent population of India will be urban by the year 2050. With this pattern of urbanization, the urban population of 377 million as in 2011 will be 1915 million by the year 2050. The urban land is about 7.74 million hectares, which is 2.35 percent of the country's total land area. Urban planning in India is generally concerned with development of land. The Indian constitution initially recognized to acquire, hold and dispose of property as a fundamental right. Later on, when land was to be compulsorily acquired, compensation at market price was payable. With the enactment of Urban Land Ceiling and Regulation Act 1976 that attempted nationalization of vacant urban land by paying nominal amount. The term compensation was replaced by the term amount. Finally, the fundamental right to property was deleted from the constitution. The first articulation of the urban land policy was proposed by the urban land policy committee ministry of health appointed by the government of India in 1965. The committee articulated the following land policy objectives. First, to achieve optimum social use of urban land. Second, to make land available in adequate quantity at right time and for reasonable prices to both public authorities and individuals. And third, to encourage cooperative community effort and bona fide individual builders in the field of land development, housing and construction. Fourth, to prevent concentration of land ownership in a few private lands, in a few private hands and especially to safeguard the interest of the poor and underprivileged section of the urban society. Further, the committee observed that to realize the objectives, there is no escape from large scale public acquisition, if the question of guiding urban development or the provision of adequate housing and other facilities is to be tackled effectively and large scale advance acquisition of land would really be in the interest of the society as a whole. It is by far the best and perhaps the only way to put an end to speculation in land and to capture subsequent increase in land values. These surpluses were realized by the public authorities should benefit the community in more ways than one. Therefore, the role model of Indian town planners, Delhi master plan, Chandigarh, Gandhi Nagar and Navi Mumbai were all based on public ownership of land. However, Securing large scale public ownership of land implied compulsory acquisition of land. There was considerable discontent amongst the original landowners about the manner in which compensation was determined and paid. The Land Acquisition Act 1894 initially provided the date of declaration of intention to acquire the land as the reference date for determining the market value. However, no time limit was laid down for actual payment of compensation. 1984 amendments introduced the time limit of 3 years and also provided for payment of interest from the date of award to actual payment of procession of land and solitium of 30 percent of market value. However, the market value is to be reckoned at current use value at the exclusion of expected rise in value on account of future use. The right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2030 which is amended as the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement amendment ordinance 2015 and the resettlement and rehabilitation policy 
which passed in 2007 attempted to remove many of these lacuna but planned urban development is not being recognized as a public purpose for which powers of eminent domain could be used and in practical terms the proposed method of deciding compensation and rehabilitation package would make recourse to compulsory acquisition of land expensive for lands that also require substantial investment in trunk infrastructure this would compel search for new paradigms in respect of urban land policy thank you